Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session on how and when to hire an associate. So uh, I am grateful for our panelists for joining today. We have Belinda Lee and Andrew McKee, and Dave Bernie's going to be joining us in a minute. Um, let me go through what I thought we'd have as the agenda. For the, um, I'll just kind of tee up the areas. Uh, and then I'll ask for what other topics we want to cover, what other questions you have. And then we'll go in and start asking the panelists their point of view on the questions. Okay, so um, I put some thought into uh, what we ought to cover. So let me share my screen. All right, here we go. Share my screen. And can I slideshow from current slide? Oh, not, oh that worked. Okay, great. Um, so that we could go through what are some pros and cons of hiring a full time employee? Uh, a lot of people go as independent consultants go through a bit of a series of stages. So they might start out by becoming an independent consultant, um, just getting some work from former clients, people they know, contacts, or through intermediaries, and just filling up their own dance card. Then they might start generating some work uh, on their own and have need for leverage. So they start bringing on some independent contra contractors from time to time. Uh, and as their ability to consistently generate some demand grows, people think about, okay, maybe I should hire a full-time employee. Um, but what are some pros and cons of that? Want to hear about that. Um, what's the impact on your service offering? So if it's just you, then you can kind of do whatever people need. Um, but if you start hiring an employee, it starts you know, driving you to maybe having a little bit more defined service offering. So you need to get a bit more crisp, perhaps, on what your firm does. Um, when should you hire? It's like, what's the right point of time? How do you go about that recruiting process? How have people done that successfully? Uh, if you hire someone, how do you start giving that person a career path and developing them? Um, maybe, what are the different options there? Maybe you'll hire someone mid-career who's happy and where they're at, or do you hire a junior person and try to train them up and try to build a rainmaker, someone who's eventually going to be able to sell work on their own, and some compliance uh, matters. The compliance matters, for example, an offer letter, uh, workers' comp, unemployment insurance, benefits, payroll, uh, those are the topics. So I'll stop sharing my screen because it's kind of boring to look at the screen. And I want to see, before we jump into the questions, uh, drop in the chat, is there anything I missed that's on your mind? Anything I missed. So now's your, you know, you still have a chance later. It's not your only chance, but I just kind of quickly generated this what questions what I have. So I just pause a second here. Is anybody typing any kind of questions? So I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Oh. LLC versus C Corp legal structure. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, as part of recruiting best practices to attract top talent. Okay, fantastic. Part of recruiting. And um I think personal, okay, personal goals matter a lot. Yeah, so that's a great question. Like, what are you trying to do with your business, right? Are you trying, that's something that David Fields talks about. He has a nice metaphor. Are you trying to build, you know, an ATM that just puts out money, you know, when you need it? Or are you trying to build an asset, right? That you can eventually have some asset value potentially without you. So if we're all out there as independent consultants, just, you know, selling time, if we want to retire, there's no one selling time. So it's not worth anything to sell. Um, okay, when to get a partner versus an employee. Thank you, Olga. And all right, so that's a good set of questions. Feel free as we go along to pop questions in the chat. Um, let me go around the, 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 the room here and um, I'll start with you, Andrew. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of the first, those first two questions. So for you, what were the pros and cons of hiring an employee? And maybe just tell us when you decided to hire your first employee. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, so let's see, part of it has to do with the kind of work we do. So we're management consultancy specializing in growth strategy for therapeutics and diagnostics companies. So a lot of biopharma, but also other sectors within there. And so it's the kind of work where you can train up people to do a lot of the analysis and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's part of it structurally. It matters like what kind of firm, what kind of solutions you're offering as to what kind of employees you'll have. 
Um, and then the second part was we just got to a point of demand where I was pretty comfortably landing more projects than I could do myself. And I, I kind of got into doing freelance work in part to have more independence, but also to actually build a team and to not be just doing the work myself. I really wanted to have a team environment and build a, even if it was one person with me to have that culture. So that was one. And then the, maybe the third reason is kind of silly, but it comes up a lot is that we have some big corporate clients and I had some interns who were already dedicated and I converted them to hourly employees because it was, this might sound silly, but it helped meet some corporate requirements for our firm. We were so small, we were not allowed to like do work with a, a fortune 100 company unless we had payroll people and so i was like well we're going to grow eventually let's just put them on payroll so <laughs> that's interesting i should have asked you andrew to to just tell us the sort of quick story on when what from the time that you started how long were you purely independent and at what point did you hire your first employee and then how many people do you have now yeah thank you so um so i was purely independent um for two years, about 10 years ago, then I joined a boutique as a sort of uh, mid to senior person. And then uh, at a sort of benign parting of ways about five years ago, where I negotiated splitting our clients and actually brought some staff with me. So, um, but even then we started gradually. So I had, uh, so those five years ago when we officially started Headland, we had four large paying clients um, and uh, yeah, so we, um, let's see, first, we had two hourly employees start first, they're part-time hourly, and then about a year in, we um, hired our first true FTE with benefits and all that. And um, so, yeah, we're empowering growth strategy, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to reach uh, 10 full-time people next year, actually, actually staggered some starts because we're not, uh, and yeah, it's, it's part of growing business at our scale, uh, whether or not we might raise some capital to help fund our growth a little more. So we're kind of at that stage. So 10 approaching 10 full-time and all together, including client facing contractors and back office. Uh, it's about uh, 20 total people. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, sure. Let me turn to Belinda. Belinda, tell us the story of, of, of your, of your firm. Like, you know, when did you start out as an independent? At what point did you hire some employees? And I think you might've gone full circle. Right, so uh, so just to tell us your, your story and, and the pros and cons you see of having employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. So my firm is Citadel Partnership. We um, provide services to the social impact sector. Um, so a lot of nonprofit clients, public universities, some social enterprises, um, and we provide primarily strategy and market research type of um, project. So we started, or I started the firm uh, in 2011. So we just celebrated 20, 10 years uh, anniversary this year, a few days ago, actually. Um, so it, it, so I actually co-founded it with a partner who happens to be my wife now. Um, so we, I'll never say that I was not a firm uh, since the beginning, it was a firm, but it's just really the two of us uh, for, uh, thank you, <laughs> for a while. So um, in, for the first few years is primarily kind of independent contractor stuff under our company's brand. Uh, and then I would say in 2014, 15, we had a bump in kind of sales and just um, got some big projects. Uh, and then 2017, early 2017, I participated in a 10,000 small businesses program by Goldman Sachs, where we developed a growth strategy out of it. And so you know, it was at the time when I felt like, oh, maybe this is time to grow um, and how to grow. So we set a really strong kind of goal of three, three extra revenue in five years. And to do that, we need to have uh, hire these kind of personnel and all that. So in a very growth mindset at that point, going through that program, just getting excited and seeing that there was an uptick in revenue before that. I kind of plateau a little bit the year before. So I thought, okay, maybe this, we just need a kick in the butt to <laughs> grow more. Um, and primarily because, you know, growing helps us um, hopefully do bigger projects that are, that will create greater social impact. Okay. Kind of okay. So, so we hired uh, after that program, soon after the program, we hired two part-time staff and uh, an intern. Uh, one of the paid staff 
uh, part-time staff actually quickly turned out not to be a good fit. So we had to let her go. The other one stayed with us for a while. Um, so it was part-time, half-time for maybe a couple of years. And then we had to kind of switch her into hourly as, um, well, I can go into more details later, but I think there was just some challenges with um, managing staff. Um, there was, when we had projects, it was great use of her talents, but when this pipeline is kind of fluctuating, we had less use of her and then there's other issues just kind of wrapping into it. So right now we basically have going back to that old model of um, partnering with others on projects. And actually turns out we are doing even better and less stress. <laughs> so I want to kind of talk maybe when we get, get a chance to talk about that journey, I, I want to kind of echo Andrew, like what is that personal goal? Yeah, um, that's great. Getting bigger is not necessarily more profitable, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, it can be, but then there's also a higher, you know, higher uh, variability possibly because you have that um, fixed cost. Let me let me turn to David. So, David, when um, tell us your journey. Did you start as an independent consultant? Uh, tell us when do you hire your first employee and, and what are you up to now? And and how have you thought through like when is the right time to add additional staff? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so a uh, bit of background about Burning Group. Burning Group addresses, focuses on addressing the most pressing operational challenges of our clients. So we do a lot of uh, business process redesign, automation, uh, really thinking about technology and operations and how those come together. Um, <clears throat> a bit of background about, so our journey, it started similar to Belinda, um, 2011, so about the same time. Uh, so we passed our 10 year anniversary just recently. Uh, today we have 20 full time team members, and that's a combination ranging from people who are practice leaders through to um, marketing. You know, we have one full time marketing person and we've got uh, someone who's more focused on HR um, and admin. Um, the journey has been <clears throat> initially started independent. I'd say about uh, probably within the first seven months brought on um, sort of a pseudo partner, not like an equity partner, but someone who could be working on selling projects alongside of me. Uh, the first, we highly leveraged Umbrex and independent consultants, I would say over our first three years. And then we got a point, got to a point where um, we were just hitting a scale where we just needed people available <clears throat> on a consistent basis. So we um, we closed a big deal and we said, okay, this is a great opportunity. We brought on um, four full-time employees. They were at a um, business uh, a business analyst level. So maybe one or two years of work experience. Um, and then over time that's grown and we've started to then build our automation practice and we needed people who really understood um, <clears throat> back office automation and the technology itself. So we had to bring people on board. Uh, and then I would say just in the past few years, we've transitioned before the senior leadership was always people who were um, sort of contract, but working alongside me to try to sell projects. I would say about three years ago, we took a shift and now even the senior leadership team is full time. So that's been a bit of the journey and then happy to go into and, and to your question a bit, you know, why full time versus, you know, we, we also work very closely with Umbrex and we bring on independent um, consultants all the time. <clears throat> um, the benefit of someone who's full time is that they um, understand uh, your approach they're aligned with your culture. They're a known quantity. If you're bringing on someone who's independent you've never worked with before, it's, you know, can be hit or miss. And, um, you know, it's just someone who, uh, they get to know how you work. And so that next project, uh, they seamlessly fit in and follow your methodology and your approach. And by the way, they can also help with business development efforts when they're not on projects, which, uh, which is helpful. Awesome. Thank you, David. I'm gonna pick up on Sarah Sonnenfeld's question, um, which is also on our agenda. Let's talk about practically, how do you actually recruit uh, some employees? So there might be 
on campus recruiting. It might be just reach out to friends and family. Maybe you're posting it on LinkedIn or Indeed as a job. Maybe it's trying to recruit former employees from people who have experience at a consulting firm. Love to hear the strategies of, of, each, of each one of you three. Um, Andrew, let's start with you. How have you actually done the recruiting and found people writing job descriptions, like targeting it? Like, where did you go to hire the folks and how did you do it? Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, the quick answer is we use LinkedIn, uh, period, and we open we, we put openings out and then we use our network. So I assume most people have a presence on LinkedIn. Use our network to solicit referrals, too. So we got roughly 90 percent of candidates from a really strong recruit through LinkedIn and 10 percent from referrals. Um, yeah, so that, that I feel like LinkedIn's really come of age. We have tried as a sort of cautionary tale. I know it sounds like we might be one of the smaller firms of the three here. We have tried on-campus recruiting. There is a pretty intense expectation for those events uh, that I think it's it's kind of difficult to do uh, for a firm of sort of the, in my opinion, the five to 20 FTEs, because a lot of those candidates are expecting to be wooed and to have a whole package laid out about what, what the whole experience looks like at your firm. And I'm happy to say now with a part-time HR, a dedicated part-time HR person, we're now building all that stuff out, but it's still not high yield, in my opinion, versus LinkedIn. So, How about you, Belinda? How did you actually find the people that you, that you hired? And, and was it sort of friends and family and local networks or posting it on LinkedIn or advertising? How, how did you find the folks? Yeah, for the um, part-time employees, we primarily were posting in our network and got referrals. So mainly referral route as well. The interns we posted at uh, university, like career services, help us post those. Um, and we got a bunch of candidates and we interviewed them and things like that. And those you converted to uh, employees? The interns, well, one of the interns actually stayed full-time with us for a whole year. Oh. So not technically employee, but um, pretty much managed like such. Okay. How about you, David? How have you gone about hiring those for business analysts that you hired and, and continue to hire. Um, and maybe you could talk, yes, yeah, so I'll shut up and ask that question. <laughs> uh, we've used two different approaches depending on level. If, you know, we would typically uh, for analysts and for associates, so post MBA, uh, LinkedIn is our preferred source um, because they're still at a fairly generalist level. Um, that's been a good, um, a good source of attracting candidates. Let me um, pause there and ask you, David, when you say LinkedIn, are you just posting a job on LinkedIn or are you like doing a screen and identifying profiles and sending them in mails and reaching out to people proactively? So we put up a job posting and we wait for people to apply to that job posting. Okay. And of course it's sponsored and all that. Uh, typically I would say it's about, uh, $700 per, uh, per posting is about the cost once you add in the marketing fees for that. Um, we um, have found that there are challenges with that. It's a little bit reactive, right? It's like who's out there and available. Um, we've also, for more senior roles, we actually have engaged search uh, organizations uh, to help us be more proactive and uh, find people. The diff, I would say, if you're using someone from search, it's more of the specialized, um, higher seniority people where it makes sense. And um, that's been our approach. Uh, one topic has come up in the chat. Um, I'm curious to hear, and I think each of you have, ex have experience with this, um, bringing on a partner, an equity partner, who's going to share in the profit pool versus a strict employee. I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts around that dynamic and, you know, if it makes sense to bring in a partner or if it's cleaner to bring an employee. Why don't we start with you, Andrew? What's, what's your been experience? You know, thanks, Will. Uh, here, I definitely would like to be a member of the audience because it's funny, we're on, and not to be overly self-serving, but we're on that cusp of in 2022, literally ramping up behind the scenes with our HR lead the evaluation process uh, for how we'd bring in, uh, either, whether it's an equity sharing or just uh, income compensated and slash commission compensated uh, partner. We're, and then our advisors are in two extremely opposite camps. Some uh, are like, don't do it. It's the, the, the dumbest thing you could do and grow organically. Others are like, 
it's the dumbest thing you could do to not hire partners right now. And so I, I, I'll, I'll just stop there. That's my, those are my comments. Okay, so it's a really easy decision, everyone. Uh, Belinda, uh, what's your been your experience? Yeah, so we, um, I'd always kind of thought that would be a, something I would like to do, um, to bring on some partner um, to, to help grow the business. But I haven't actually taken that step. Um, I started with hiring really more manager and analyst kind of roles. Because I think there's, uh, there's always a fear of, of the culture fit as well. So we're working in that social impact space, kind of needing that, that fit and that passion, and, but also being able to do the work and then being able to speak the same language. I think there was just a, some hesitation in like who would be a good fit and bringing it in seems to be a big risk. Uh, what I found worked really well is not that kind of employee or partner relationship is, is uh, with another firm, another consulting firm that's doing basically similar work, but partnering with them. They, they are already in that same field with that same kind of mindset. And, and we are pretty much partner in that sense, just not in the same firm. So that's kind of the route I'm going these days. Okay. And uh, David, how about you? Um, so I, I have a bit of a challenge with the just the term partner because it has implications for equity and ownership. I would say that you, if, if you're interested in growing, you have to do that by bringing on other leaders. And so building out your senior leadership team, I have found is, um, I've, I've done it one way, sort of like the build it and your clients will come approach and that failed miserably. Uh, I think you need to have other leaders driving the organization um, who can be building out a practice, who can be selling new, um, new projects, and that's pretty key. How you compensate those leaders, I think there's a whole variety of different ways. Um, I have found it, you know, profit sharing uh, can be quite successful. So um, finding ways to, if, if that leader sells a project, okay, well, how are we going to share in the margin of that project? Like that is uh, one way to do it. So they're not necessarily getting equity in the firm, but they're sharing in the upside. Um, there's other um, approaches around, you know, um, equity participation that starts to get a little bit complicated and a little bit sticky, but it could be, you know, maybe you need to go there for a certain person that you, uh, that you want to be as a really key leader for you. But, you know, my message would be, if your goal is growth, you need to bring on leaders to help uh, drive that growth with you. And there's a there's a, a variety of different ways to do that, which may include equity partnership, but may not. Okay, so kind of dip, separate the question of the level and the role versus you know, how they're compensated. And we have a follow up from Sarah, David. Uh, Sarah asks, can you speak more to what failed miserably when you tried to build it and they will come? And then how how is that different from what you did that that is working better? Sure. So we were really excited. So we, we were an early leader in robotic process automation, which is one of our practice areas. And we um, had a, you know, a great first client. And then we're like, okay, we're going to go sell to a whole bunch of other clients. Okay. In order to do that, we need to make sure that we've got the team to support that. So we went out and we hired you know, uh, a number of different people at the ground level who could execute projects. Uh, and then it was sort of, they're sitting there and there were two problems. One, from a just overall financial viability, you've got this team sitting and there's no confirmed project. And we were finding the projects were taking much longer to sell than we had expected. So there was a financial challenge. But then two was you'd bring on people and they start twiddling their thumbs and actually, if you can't keep them busy, um, they get um, you know pretty dissatisfied. Um, they can, which can lead to dissatisfaction overall within the organization. And frequently, if that goes on for too long, they're just going to jump ship. So you went to all this effort to bring someone on, and then they leave, and you're like, okay, that was <clears throat> not very successful. So, so I think that's where the build it, they will come approach where you got a team ready to go and you're just waiting for a client. It, it just doesn't work. I would say find the client first, find the project, and then think about how can you sort of backfill. You need to make sure you've got a few critical roles there. So the leadership for me is where I always start. Do we have the right leaders who can lead the project? 
And then we'll be able to fill that in with the appropriate team members after that. Let's talk about career path a little bit. So um, this might uh, uh, not be necessarily the case required for everyone to, you know, to have a fancy, complicated career path. Not every person necessarily needs that. Um, some firms might set it up, and we're talking to, you know, David and Andrew have built, you know, you know, firms that are really growing in size. There's probably also a stable model of a partner level person who hires you know, two associates, right, who are fine being an associate for two or three years and then rotate and go to business school or something. That's probably a model. But for, uh, for folks who are, you know, building, you know, firms that are growing and says, Andrew, how have you thought about career path? And I think you mentioned you brought on an HR person to help you with that. Uh, how, how do you design career paths for people to start junior and then advance to, you know, mid-level, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, we so we have not been as formal as some consulting firms are, and some of our competitors even like on their website have like a little diagram decision tree kind of thing. Which I um, we generally, but the way I, I, I describe it to our staff is that uh, we hire everyone at an analyst or associate. So also for just to back up for a second, we have like sort of partner level, which is me right now. We have a few ju acting junior partners who aren't officially junior partners, but are growing into that kind of role. You know, we have engagement managers, associates, and analysts as far as seniority and skill level. Um, so the analysts and associates, we, uh, you know, I expect they would stay on to become associates if they're analysts and then become engagement managers. Uh, and we invest, I think, a bit more than a typical firm of our size in uh, building homebrewed trainings and supporting them uh, to, to build their skills. So we're investing a lot in them. Um, the, the second part is whether or not, and it's to be D, TBD for us, whether or not we can retain our engagement managers uh, long enough to become junior partners. And I think we can, and we're trying to build out, we may end up hiring an outside vendor, build out some sales training for them to uh, over time. And actually we rolled out a pilot program this year where they're getting incentivized to do that. So uh, that's kind of, it's just sort of like a two part career path, um, get to EM and then potentially EM and beyond realizing that's just kind of a slow cooker to get beyond EM for someone who's grown up in the firm, so to speak. All right. Um, how, about, how about you, David? I'll come to David and then Belinda. David, how have you thought about career path? For your, your own slightly larger firm. It's actually very similar to Andrew. So I think that you know I uh, I worked at McKinsey for eight years uh, prior to starting Burning Group, and so I'm just like that's what I know, right? So we've got analysts, senior analysts, and then associates, you can jump from a senior analyst to associate without needing to go back to uh, get an MBA, unlike, you know, the big firms. And once you're an associate, you can be a senior associate, then an engagement manager. And then we're just at the point now where we've had full-time team members for seven years, where we've got senior engagement managers. And then that next step, we'll be moving into a principal uh, type of role. So that's the approach that, uh, it's the approach that we followed. It seems to seems to work. And I think that, um, you know, uh, the concept of people continuously moving through the stages, the problem, because I always wondered when I was in McKinsey, like, why, what's with this upper out? You know, the challenge is people do stagnate if they get to a certain position and just that's their upper limit. So we like to keep seeing people progress up through those different levels. Thank you. Uh, Belinda, can you talk about how you thought about career path and also training? So how have you invested in training, either formal, informal, external resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in our case, we, so like I said, we hired um, kind of half-time staff and that's actually by, uh, by desire on their end as well. Um, so those were two um, kind of mothers of young children who appreciated this flexibility of a half-time structure. And um, I'll talk about one staff that actually stayed with us all in all three years in total. And we actually started primarily having her help with internal marketing stuff. So more of a promotional, building up our um, kind of promotional materials, um, content, et cetera. But it was uh, quickly kind of evidence to us that she could also do um, research and help with some client work. So that in that in kind of more lateral progression of career, so giving her more responsibilities of doing client work, being client uh, facing, doing interviews, 
um, as well as managing the intern. So giving her some of that managerial role. And she really enjoyed both, that, that, that growth that way over time. Um, so I would say, um, think about kind of growth in career path in different ways too. Uh, if, if you don't have a very structured um, kind of ladder, like how, how can they grow still in, the, in their skill sets and responsibilities and satisfaction therefore. Um, in terms of training, we were very informal. Um, we um, encourage them to take online courses that they can find that are interested, we'll pay for it. Um, we just kind of hands-on training, right, on the job. <laughs> how, do I, how would I do things? And this is like, try, try to um, learn from that. So not a lot of formal, formal training. All right, thank you. Andrew, you mentioned that you have um, engaged an outside firm. Uh, could you just maybe, if you're open to sharing, maybe mention the name of that firm or, or tell us what they do and any other sort of formal or informal training that you've put in place? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, so let's see, let's see if I remember them off the top. This is the fun thing about growing a business too. At some point we're empowering so much. I give the guardrails to the team and they do a great job and I actually don't always know. Um, no, um, that's somewhat, half, that's half a joke, half true. Um, uh, we, so for, because we do a fair amount of uh, cash flow analysis and st st for strategic purposes, we use, uh, I believe, Wall Street Prep, which a lot of leading healthcare investment banks use to train their analysts on doing Excel modeling and discounted cash flow analysis. We work with Duarte on the slide development side. I have to say that's such a, in my opinion, such a highly sort of, um, it's a hard skill to train. So we've never had extremely awesome success with those training vendors. You just kind of, there's a lot of on the job training. Um, and then, yeah, similar, we, we, similar to, um, uh, to Belinda, we do some like Coursera slash, uh, you know, stuff like that if, if the staff finds them. So that's, and then uh, the last is the homebrew trainings where uh, I'll, I'll try to observe some systematic needs. And so for instance, for a while we were working on client service and what does, and actually leveraging a lot of the great uh, material on, on Will's podcast and, and the Umbrex network about what is great client service looks like from beginning, middle to end and having a whole toolkit for engagement managers to follow and, 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 and do those best practices. Uh, we also have the staff share on lunch and learns a kind of knowledge or skills sharing. So for instance, we had some staff do some Monte Carlo and probabilistic modeling that was highly valued by our clients and it was new for some other folks. So they would do a lunch and learn just to explain what they did. Um, so yeah, those are a few uh, things we've done. Great. Uh, let's talk about compliance for a minute. So what are all the kind of practical factors that you need to think about? So you've identified the candidate, now you want to bring them on as an employee. Uh, I, I had you know, listed out for myself, some thinking around, um, there's like an offer letter, there's um, a, you need to think at workers comp insurance, unemployment insurance, uh, put the person on payroll, um, Andrew, can you, can you walk us through just like the compliance aspects that people should be aware of? Yeah, uh, sure, I'll try. Again, the caveat that I think I chatted that we, we did end up working with a, uh, a really great regional law firm uh, where we got a referral to like the, the top partner at that firm and she's been fantastic. And so, uh, and that's maybe a general word of advice. Like I did, maybe if this is my fourth time running this kind of business, I might not have done that, but I didn't want to get like some legal Zoom contracts and just be like, and not know what I'm getting into. It's both on the employee and contractor side, uh, but also with clients. Uh, and, and, and frankly, in my experience, I'm, thank goodness I haven't, it's always good to be prepared. I haven't had many, like basically any employee and contractor issues, but with the clients, there's a lot of like aggressive language you'll get in contracts. This is a bit off topic to your question, but uh, yeah, so, it, and sometimes they do it by default because they're like, it's some template contract that they, it's the most aggressive contract. And then it's not appropriate for a management consulting firm. So you have to, you know, push back on stuff. Um, as far as, let's see. So um, yeah, so uh, actually I got a little off. So what was the, the thrust of your question? Make sure. Yeah, so in terms of compliance, you know, oh, I, compliant, yeah. yeah, just like what are the things that, yeah, let's say you've, you're used to maybe bringing people on as a contractor, you know how to issue a 1099 for US folks for a contractor, but if you actually want to have an employee, what's the checklist of things that you need to be prepared to do 
to, to kind of take that step. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Well, yeah. So uh, on the, on the legal side, it was getting an offer letter and checking in with the HR expert at the law firm. Um, on the payroll side, um, a lot of that comes these days with when you have, so you got to get a payroll vendor, which takes some time. Uh, and we use Gusto. I'm mostly happy with them with the caveat that with a lot of remote work, there are a lot of states asking for new capturing of um, unemployment uh, benefits and so forth that requires a lot of like our back office team, like jumping through all sorts of hoops and doing stuff that was like, we were not doing like two years ago. So right. um, I think that's gonna happen with any payroll provider, whether it's ADP with one of the larger ones or Gusto. Um, workers comp usually handle that through a separate um, insurance broker on with a so business insurance broker. So, and, and this is a whole separate topic too, but we have uh, errors and emissions uh, liability. We have uh, general liability insurance. We have automotive liability, which some of our clients require contractually. I think that'll decline a bit with all the hybrid work. And then last is we have workers comp. So that tends to come through that. The question about unemployment, uh, you know, unemployment benefits, I think that's covered through the states, the way you pay and the withholding through the states. I, I could be wrong there, but that hasn't been an explicit thing. So that's generally, those are the uh, items. And then, and then you have to think about benefits. So there, that's a huge long list. I, I felt like, again, like any small business, you'd slowly build up what you want to offer. So uh, like right now we offer 401k, healthcare, dental, vision. The broker even found like some life insurance to, to bundle in with that. Um, uh, and we have disability, we have a, uh, and, you know, paternity and maternity leave benefits that are uh, paid for a certain amount of time. But, you know, when we first started, it was just a matter of getting the healthcare figured out. And that you again work, this is where it gets complicated. You work with another firm. It's usually going to be a broker who specializes in uh, uh, giving these options to your staff and figuring out what kind of rules across the board you're going to, sorry, to bring back full circle, but this is where it helps to have the HR counsel to make sure you're being fair and consistent. So if you're going to pay, say, 80, 90, 100% of the healthcare benefits that you're doing that across the board, you're really clear about your sick leave and your vacation uh, and paid vacation policy and whether it accrues or not. There are all these sort of details that go into that offer letter being uh, fair, consistent, and comprehensive. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. I definitely concur with, you know, to work with an employment attorney and not just to download some kind of contract off of LegalZoom or something because there's so many particulars for your situation, your state, what kind of employee, what their duties are, where they're going to work, and you know if there's sort of intellectual property restrictions and non-competes, a lot of different um, dimensions to that. So concur with working with a, um, a labor law attorney on those matters. Um, uh, Belinda, do you have anything to add to what Andrew said in terms of hiring people? And then I want to hear David, like if there's anything different in Canada that you you know non-US perspective. Mm -hmm. Belinda. Yeah, sure. So we also used a, a HR consulting firm in our case to produce a kind of package of checklist and um, onboarding stuff. Um, so I would say start actually start with application form and reference checks so even before you've made that offer. Um, the application form capture all the data, um, reference check. We also do background check on those we kind of want to hire um, because a consulting firm, there's client liability, things like that. They are very, very low cost um, to do. And then the offer letter, um, you know, obviously all the steps about gathering W4s, I9, all those things, getting copies of IDs, things like that. And we do ask the, our staff to sign NDA and non-compete as well. So we have that set up, payroll, um, we use ADP. And then I want to add is that uh, on, if you ever have to terminate an employee, that is a you know, very important kind of compliance step to take into account. So we, we had to let, let go a staff. So really having that, those exit interviews, document the reasons, uh, getting approval to provide references for them in the future. And if they don't want detailed references, at least getting approval that you can tell people they have worked with you at this period of time. Um, so there's no kind of debate or hopefully no kind of legal issue afterwards. So, so that's another process to have. Thank you. David, any Anything different outside the U.S. that you dealt with in Canada? Mostly easier. <laughs> uh, and in terms of what's been covered, I think that most of the topics have been touched on. Just, you know, a few other things that come to mind. Uh, we, uh, benefits are definitely a discussion. And so we like to 
benchmark ourselves against the uh, the big four consulting firms, and um, you know the uh, Deloitte, CUIs, KPMGs, etc. We think that that's a uh, fairly good comparison. We're trying to compete for, for very similar types of people. Um, we also, one of the things that we hadn't done, um, which we added, uh, was rules about if someone does want to leave, um, giving appropriate notice. Uh, we hadn't built that in for some reason. So we had someone, you know, it was like, I'm, I'm out of here and <clears throat> I'm, um, as of today, <laughs> it's like, well, no, like that's pretty high risk. So it was important to, to build that in a, a notice period for them if they want to leave. We had it if we want to ask them to leave. Um, and I think those are, um, you know, I, I think that the taking the time to set it properly is important as well as a good onboarding process. We find that we have found that uh, you go through all this work, you find someone, you hire them, day one comes, and then the onboarding process, they're like, uh, hello, especially in this virtual wor world, right? It's like, Okay, great. They're they're there. They're like in your mind. It's like okay, when I've got the project, but for them, they're like sitting there and it's like crickets, right? So you need to think about the right onboarding process, how you get them uh, engaged and trained, how you make sure there's a laptop ready for them on day one. These are some of the things you need to think through. Thank you. Um, I'll give a plus one on Gusto. Uh, Umbrex, we use Gusto as well. It's worked out fine. I'd say if you want to save yourself some heartache uh, and back office work. We, we use a, an outsourced bookkeeping firm to, um, to just kind of do our financials, right? We do have an internal person who's sending invoices and you know, setting up payments to subcontractors and so forth. We use an external firm for bookkeeping, and then we also rely on them to do all the admin for setting up uh, like an employee in a new state and dealing with gusto and the payroll. And that's... Um, it's not super cheap, but it's certainly a massive relief in terms of headache uh, of getting this to offer plate. So I get all these notices in from Michigan State, Illinois, whatever, just, you know, Oregon. I just send it to the uh, to the bookkeeping firm uh, and been happy to have their support on that. Um, so let's see. I want to uh, um, just sort of now open it up and uh, I'll just kind of go to gallery view here and see if anyone else has any questions. You can maybe put, press the little raise your hand button and just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, you know, who else has any questions for the team? Or maybe, I, actually, let me just pause there. Before you have questions, is there anybody else who has an employee that wasn't a panelist and maybe want to add your perspective? Was there anybody else here who, who has employees? No, okay. I don't see anyone. All right, so just go ahead. Any questions from the, from the, from the group here? Raise your hand. If not, I will go back to one of the questions that we had. Um, okay, we had a question from Benjamin. So, um, has anyone, either Belinda or Andrew, uh, David, anyone else, thought about hiring someone from outside the United States, um, or, can, or in your case, David, from outside of Canada, and dealt with sort of cross-border issues? Yeah, I can speak to, so Canada has a <clears throat> unique relationship with the U.S. And so we've got a, a used to be called the North American Free Trade Agreement. I forget what it's called now, yeah. but um, <clears throat> it, generally uh, easy to flow between Canada and the U.S. And um, um, the process to set that up, you, you need a lawyer to set up for you first time, but after that, it's fairly easy to get to have the right documentation and get the visa so that you can work for a given project. Thanks. Sarah Sonnenfeld had a question early on uh, about LLC versus C Corp legal structure. Um, now I'll say I'm not an attorney and you should definitely check with yours, Sarah, but at least my understanding is that shouldn't affect imp hiring employees, it's particularly if you're not giving equity or something, right? The LLC versus C Corp, the main distinction that I've been able to figure out with that is if you're a C Corp, you actually have to pay yourself as an owner a fair salary, right? So you're paying yourself a salary and you're paying yourself potentially some profit distributions. But just in terms of 
hiring employees, like the entity is kind of the entity. And I don't think there should be any big difference uh, between them. Again, not legal advice here, but that's my understanding. Um, as long as you have like an entity, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, I'll, I'll vamp a little bit and just share some of my, my own kind of uh, editorializing just in terms of pros and cons, how I think about it. So, you know, to kind of re to recap and some of what we heard. So some of the pros of hiring an employee is that you can then start having someone that you can depend is going to be there. You can invest in training that person up in your, you know, PowerPoint style and your standard operating procedures and how you do projects. You can also start, um, it, it, whether you call this a pro or con, it also does force you to start getting more serious about what is your service offering, right? For those of us independents, we can do a lot of different things. One day we do a due diligence, next thing we do a supply chain management thing, next thing we do a strategy. But if you have an employee then you know, who's like an associate, unless that person's gonna tag along and also do whatever with you, you sort of have to start saying that, okay, you know, we do robotic process automation and we have a robotic process automation associate and an EM who do that. And it says it on our website that that's what we do. People call us for that service. So you, it does kind of force you to be a little bit more grown up in terms of your fishing line and your positioning. Um, so that's something to think about if you if you want to get into that. It's hard, I found, at least like as an intermediary in a staffing firm, sometimes I'll talk to people who do have an associate and it's tough to plug in like two people. It's tougher often to plug in two people into a project um, where it, if it's not exactly what their service offering is. So, um, the cons obviously are, you know, needing to put the investment into recruiting. It's often um, a little bit, you know, bigger investment to hire a full-time employee than just to find a subcontractor. Um, so there's some pros and cons. Uh, any other questions or commentary? You came here, you know, to uh, well, learn about this. What, what, what else? Andrew, go ahead. Anything? Yeah, Will, I, I think, I don't know if we answered your question earlier. There's a few other thoughts I had. You asked about job descriptions. I was trying to think back to like hiring the first FTE. I think it is worthwhile. This may sound too tactical, but to sit down for maybe take a day off or two, even though you're juggling projects and really take the time to write out the job description yourself and think about what's in it for this future employee. And especially, you know, we're in this, uh, it's, it's a very great market to be looking for a job as a, from the candidate's perspective. So I think you really have to be ready as a sort of N of one consultant leader to bring something that they couldn't find at a more established consulting firm or professional job. So, um, and hopefully that, like for me, that was like, I value a lot uh, of teaching and mentoring and coaching. So for our first true full-time employee, it was really important, I think for him, that he was getting a lot of hands-on oversight and really a ton of on the job training for me um, and about the industry. And again, and the, they have to continue to see that that's worthwhile, that as you continue to build a small culture, Hopefully it's going to be less drama, more focus on learning and doing great work than many uh, big companies uh, offer. And then again, that's part of why we over dialed a bit on the training relative to our larger competitors. So I think those are all really important considerations. When we get a little bit bigger, we have an HR person where I can like throw ideas out about the, the job description and they can draft it and I can say, oh, it's a bit of this one plus that one. Uh, you know, and they can do a lot of the legwork. So it gets a little easier over time, but it, it was important to like think it through myself. And sorry, the last lesson learned is that uh, I probably didn't do enough of that earlier on. And I um, had some, you know, painful lessons, whether it's contractors or employees, where I was just like, oh yeah, let's get somebody in here to do this work. And then again, depends on, this is the other thing, depends on not only your personal goals, but your uh, business's intentions. So if, if you're trying to distinguish yourself on you know, some key competitive advantage and then your contractors or employees are dropping the ball on that key dimension, that's like really bad, right? So you have to figure out how to solve that. And again, you may have to invest more time, possibly some money, but definitely a lot of time and thinking about how to get the right people. And as also as David said, deal with them if it's not working out. You have to get all that stuff ready. Now, it occurs to me that one thing that we've been mostly assuming in our discussion so far is about hiring an employee who would be a you know associate or a consultant right um, but we haven't talked about uh, hiring an executive assistant 
uh, or some kind of internal operational assistant kind of person. And that might even be a first step that a lot of people should consider um, because you can find someone who doesn't necessarily need to be full-time, right? You might get someone initially for five or 10 hours a week, and then if it works out, maybe you gradually add the time over time. That I think is something that a lot of people uh, don't necessarily think about and don't do early enough um, where there might be just sending invoices, doing various administrative stuff, um, maybe managing your LinkedIn profile or even helping manage your email that could be done by someone very capable in the 20 to $50 an hour range, depending on the level of person who very, very capable. You can often get someone who's willing to work remotely, uh, work flexible hours and uh, can just, that is almost, almost one-to-one, -one, you know, freeing up hours of your time, right? So huge leverage from doing that. And that might even be something you think about before hiring an associate to execute, freeing up more of your time for the, from administrative duties. Um, and some, Sarah just posted, she just posted for an EA yesterday. All right, third round, that's awesome. And uh, Edwina mentioned that she has a virtual assistant and that uh, you wanna find someone who fits your style, definitely. Um, so take some time to interview the right person. You will be spending you know, a lot of time with that person. Um, yeah, and we'll, Will, we'll, like, Will oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. we go to Margarita. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I'm dialing in for my car in between appointments. Um, if I may, I just also want to say that culture happens. I mean, you guys know this. I don't have to say this, but you guys know this. Culture happens and like an employee experience happens whether you design it or not. Um, and so if you're hiring one or you're hiring five, you really have to think about that um, because it is a competitive workforce out there. And although you, you know, maybe some people can't play um, and offer really amazing benefits and amazing packages, you know, you can offer a really wonderful, kind place to check in every day that gives you opportunity to grow, gives you opportunity to connect and enjoy the people you're working with. And, and that matters. Um, and uh, so I just want to kind of remind everybody about that. Yeah. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, Jeffrey had a question about raising capital and who typically invests in consulting firms. Um, and I don't well, know. Well, I will. I'll take that one. All right, I think, David. I think Andrew mentioned uh, his response uh, in the in the notes, and my response is I have absolutely no idea. So if you have another uh, session with people who have gone through that process, it, to be honest, it terrifies me a little bit. The giving up control, understanding what's a fair valuation. Um, you know, I, I think for me that is something I'm. I'd be interested in. So if you do have people who have been through that process, I think it'd be interesting to hear about. Okay, that's a great suggestion, David. Um, and we actually do know a firm, their name just slips my mind, that helps consulting firms sell their business. And we may do a session on that. Um, it tends to be firms that need to be a bit, a, bit, a bit larger, right? So typically to sell your practice, you need to be able to walk away yourself and have it continue running as a going concern. So you know, of the, those of us on the call, like David might be the closest one to that point, but still maybe you know, not even necessarily there. Um, I don't know of many people that will actually invest in giving capital to a firm. It's hard enough to get even a line of credit. Um, but uh, you know, if, you, if you know someone and want to share, just reach out to me on that. Um, any final questions? We'll maybe take one more question before we wrap it up. Uh, anyone else? For those Sorry, for those who hired uh, an executive assistant, where did you guys do that? Did you just post on LinkedIn or did you use a particular service? I would be curious. I used a service. I would advise against LinkedIn in this case, just because there are so many people with the qualifications. You're going to have a thousand applications and absolutely no way to tell this person's good and that person's not. So I find... We used a search company that specializes in that level because search companies, have, you know, they've got different areas of specialization. Uh, there was one that really focused well on sort of that frontline employee, um, and we used them, and we were pretty happy uh, happy with the result. Yeah, yeah certainly. I, I, we used a slightly different. Or just quickly, we used Upwork, and we used a sort of contractor to hire model where we 
I gave a pretty, pretty demanding assessment on Upwork. So we had like one person succeed in the event, in the application process and she was awesome. And then we gave her a test project scheduling things in three continents. So really hard for a scheduler to do. And she did it flawlessly. And then she was a contractor for right, like two years. And then we, uh, she was our first back office FTE uh, and she's awesome. And we, uh, so she's on payroll now and we gave her an ex expanded her scope. So she has a bit of a super admin uh, function where she helps with some of the things we'll mention like uh, invoicing and back office operations. I didn't feel super comfortable having a contractor do, but once it, she became an employee, I felt a bit more like we can kind of open the whole financials of the business and talk more openly about these things that were driving me a little crazy as we scale. You just have to have more help. Yeah. Yeah. If you go through your day and just keep track of each thing you do and ask yourself, do I need to do this myself really? Or is this something that's proceduralizable that we could have someone else do? Um, how much of your time could you free up? So, all right, well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you everyone for your questions. We'll wrap it up here, you know, two minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, we do our redoing recording on this. And we also had our um, resource writer, Natalie, join us for part of this. So we're gonna be writing this up as a resource in a summary version. So if you have additional points to add or additional questions that weren't asked today, please send them to me uh, so that we can try to answer them in that written resource. So thank you everyone for joining. Thanks everyone.